So another uh, nice evening with a very important topic that is hemolytic uremic syndrome because nowadays even uh, more and more patients are being detected and they are being treated with various modalities. So uh, I think without uh, taking more, more of the time, uh, I will just request uh, Dr. Aditi Sina to start with her topic, HUS in children. Uh, Dr. Aditi. She is additional professor, Division of Nephrology, Department of Pediatrics, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Aditi, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, ma'am. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, before I begin uh, this session, I must uh, thank the division uh, uh, and its chief, Professor Baka. Much of the work that we will present from our unit has been led by him. And uh, this is a good opportunity that sir is also present here alongside our two moderators. So the topic is on hemolytic uremic syndrome in children. And hemolytic uremic syndrome in ch childhood, uh, as well as in adults, is overall a very severe disease, but an overall a very rare disease. If you look at what incidence estimates exist for that disorder, you'll find that uh, there's only up to one to eight cases per 100,000 population per year that would be affected by hemolytic uremic syndrome. And within which, what is termed as atypical HUS, that is, that does not have a precedent of bloody dysentery or diarrhea, uh, would be even rarer and would constitute even much smaller fraction of that population. Uh, it is a disorder that is very, very rare. It comprises about 10 to 15 percent of all hemolytic uremic syndrome children, and uh, it tends to be probably a bit more common in childhood than in adulthood. Uh, but overall, if you look at in the context of what severe acute kidney injury that we would see arriving at the hospital, with severe acute kidney injury instead of that which develops in the hospital which is more often sepsis associated and called hospital acquired if you look at the community acquired severe acute kidney injury it would be one of the leading causes of community acquired severe acute kidney injury now that diarrheal dehydration and other injury other conditions are less common this is now emerging as the most important one of the most important causes by for which children get dialyzed uh, when they arrive in the hospital with severe acute kidney injury it's also something that has relatively high mortality uh, more so in the atypical cases if you look at how we classify hemolytic uremic syndrome, now this is from an elegant review that was recently published and co-authored by Professor Baga uh, in the Lancet last year. And if you look at the classification, you will see that infection-associated hemolytic uremic syndrome continues to comprise a fair proportion of cases of HUS, probably the leading cause of hemolytic uremic syndrome till date, among which the STEC HUS or the shiga toxin-producing organisms causing uh, uh, causing hemolytic uremic syndrome would be the leading cause, of which e uh, e hemolytic uh, e. coli would be the most important cause. Other infections such as strep pneumonia and influenza H1N1 would be less common causes. The other important fraction to remember is the atypical cases, which are now beginning to emerge, particularly so in tertiary care centers and lead uh, centers where, uh, and in countries where the hygiene standards have improved and cases of infection associated HUS are becoming to be less common. Therein, the atypical uh, HUS cases are beginning to become more common. And we'll discuss about some of these cases. Uh, there are then other causes. You must remember that in adult uh, patients, thrombotic microangiopathy which is the histological hallmark of hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, would more often be caused by other entities, such as drug-induced, uh, being pregnancy-induced, occurring in the context of a transplantation, or in other secondary scenarios, such as with malignant hypertension, with uh, uh, systemic lupus, and other conditions. Uh, a small fraction of cases of hemolytic uremic syndrome, particularly in childhood, we must remember, is not mediated by the typical causes of atypical HUS. That is, the complement-mediated atypical HUS is the leading uh, chunk of cases comprising the majority of cases of atypical HUS. But then some conditions which are not related to the complement pathway, such as DGKE and WT1, would also be important, as well as metabolism pathway defects, such as cobalamin defects and thrombomodular defects. So this is a guideline that we would recommend all our postgraduates to read. Uh, this is published in 2019 in the Pediatric Nephrology, coming from uh, our country, the, how to manage the hemolytic uremic syndrome in a developing country in an Indian context. And we'll come to this deliberation of why 
a developing country perspective is important vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Western perspective of how to manage this entity. Uh, you can see that the classification here outlined here is overall similar to what we have just seen in the slide previously. You would have infection associated causes as the most important. Then you would need to think about other infections as a pneumococcal and other infection associated HBS such as in influenza, but also several other viruses and bacteria. Secondary forms have to be ruled out and cobalamin pathway defects have also to be remembered as a rare but important cause. What, when you leave these aside, you, you are left with what is known as atypical HUS, which is predominantly defects in the alternate complement pathway, but also defects uh, which are involving non-complement proteins such as DGKE and thromomodulin. And uh, these are not always inherited defects and sometimes be acquired, such as autoantibodies to factor H. The triad of hemolytic genomic syndrome uh, is uh, this being a very clinical diagnosis, is based around diagnosing a patient who has severe AKI and also has thrombocytic cytopenia and has anemia, which is microangiopathic. So the blood film would definitely show you evidence of hemolysis, which is intravascular in the form of schistocytes. And you can see these broken cells, uh, which, which are bitten off at the edges, uh, leading to these helmet kind of shapes. And you would also see a paucity of platelets on the film that indicates thrombocytopenia. And you, you might have an elevated reticulocyte count indicating the release of immature red cells from the bone marrow. Uh, you would have other surrogate markers being present of hemolysis, such as an elevated lactate dehydrogenase or a depressed haptoglobulin. So uh, we will go forward and beyond this classification to look at what is the most common cause of HUS all over the world still, which is sugar toxin associated HUS. Now we know this diagram of the timeline very, very well since our microbiology days, that sometimes a fraction of patients who get shigella toxin associated infections, such as shigella dysentriae or stick, uh, e. Coli, stick producing E. coli infections would after ingestion of the bacterium develop symptoms of bloody diarrhea, following which uh, the bloody diarrhea would usually resolve in most cases, but within about seven days or so of the diarrhea, about 15% of cases would go on to develop hemolytic genomic syndrome. And this happens because the sugar toxin that is released from into the bloodstream uh, might go and bind on to the monocytes and the platelets uh, uh, cell surfaces via what is known as uh, the global triazyl ceramide goes and therefore then, then also uh, uh, goes to the bloodstream in different places. And it can bind on the endothelial cells, particularly in certain capillary beds, such as the kidneys, uh, directly by the same receptor and then get internalized. And then it triggers a variety of pathways as shown in this cartoon and initiates inflammation of various kinds. And this inflammation attracts neutrophils. It, it causes inflammation, injury to the endothelium, attracts neutrophils and causes further injury. And this uh, leads to uh, injury to the endothelium leads to a site where platelets uh, get deposited from thrombi and lead to injury. Now, most often, this is caused in most countries by an organism known as the O157H7, the strain of E. coli that is most commonly associated with stick HUS in Europe and also everywhere in the world. The other strain that has now emerged to be very important is O26H11. Uh, the other strain, but many other strains, almost 100 other strains have also come to be uh, known in the picture. Uh, one 2011 outbreak was particularly very, very severe caused in Germany by a different strain, which was not really an, uh, 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 a typical kind of a pathogen. It had a plasmid acquired into an enteroaggregative kind of E. coli, and this was the O104H4. It caused a very severe infection, chiefly infecting adults, and a lot of morbidity was associated with it. About India, we have always believed through our microbiology textbooks for ages that Shigella dysentery is probably the leading cause of stick HUS in the country. But it seems that the epidemiology of this infection is changing, and probably we are seeing less and less cases of Shigella dysentery, particularly in northern and eastern parts of the country. Overall, our guidelines, I'm just in the sake of interest of time, we'll just quickly summarize that stick HUS, one must need to demonstrate that the pathogen is indeed present, which can produce uh, the sugar toxin. And for that, you need to demonstrate by positive stool culture, the presence of the organism, and also to demonstrate the presence of the antigen. So you need to demonstrate either that, uh, that the organism is present by stool culture, and then indicate the presence of the uh, toxin by either the PCR or by uh, uh, LISA for the toxin or by indicating a rise in the antibody titer against over a fourfold rise over a period of time following the infection. If you cannot confirm it by these and you only have an association of a temporal association of bloody diarrhea being present and or an outbreak is present and HUS develops in that context, then you can call it a suspected case, but this is not yet a confirmed case.
So how would you manage this condition? Any child who presents with severe infectious gastroenteritis and has uh, bloody diarrhea would be at risk of have developing this condition. You'd want to document that this pathogen is indeed a steak producing organism. Uh, you would look for the uh, watch for the symptoms and signs of hemolytic uremic syndrome, acute kidney injury present, demonstrate the triad of hemolytic uremic syndrome, and then just carry on supportive measures. These patients, uh, the use of antibiotics in these patients is pretty controversial, but uh, uh, you know, it's, given the high mortality, one would elect to use uh, uh, antibiotics which are bactericidal. And uh, very often, uh, I mean, most of the cases should not develop HUS. On the other hand, uh, the, the other thing to take care of is to ensure adequate hydration, because if you don't ad ensure adequate hydration in these individuals, the toxin would probably be more concentrated in the bloodstream and probably at slightly higher risk of causing HUS. On the other hand, one would not suggest using uh, measures that we typically use for patients with atypical HUS, and we'll come to those like plasma exchanges and eclusimab or complementary patient of other kinds. Other therapies, while people have tried out in various ways, uh, looking at absorbers of the toxin or using steroids or binders, other binders of toxin, et cetera, have not worked out, and you would not really rely on any of these measures. So the boxes indicate the level of evidence for these uh, guidelines and the strength of these guidelines, and in the interest of time, we would not be able to dwell on those. This brings us to what is known as atypical HUS. Now, what is atypical HUS is that which is not preceded by a prodrome of bloody diarrhea, uh, the presence of spec pathogens in the stool, and this would be uh, not always be a definitive way to diagnose. What we know is that the majority of patients with atypical HUS would have at their in their background a tendency to have the activation of the complement cascade. The alternative complement cascade is what is implicated as being triggered in these individuals and in staying triggered. Now, we know that the alternate complement pathway is almost always on in our body because it is always slowly hydrolyzing C3 to form C3B and a small amount of C3BBB or the C3 convertase is constantly being formed in the body in the bloodstream uh, and forming a convertase to take care of any kind of insults or the uh, or the antigens that the body is encountering. This complement system is always on. However, it is kept in check by, by a variety of regulators, the primary of them being the complement factor H, the complement factor uh, D and some, some other anti uh, proteins. Now, we look at this pathway. This kind of indicates how all the orange boxes that you can see chief regulators of the complement cascade or contributors to it. So you have a C3 convertase being formed constantly. However, uh, it is it requires the presence of complement factor B and factor D to be present to form this convertase. Complement factor H makes sure that this does not keep forming uh, and it keeps this part of the pathway in check as also other portions such as influencing the degradation of the C3 convertase, ensuring that this convertase does not stay in the bloodstream. Likewise, factor I inhibits certain parts as do other membrane factors Factors such as membrane cofactor protein, etc. And all this actually was to culminate in the formation of a membrane attack complex that is the C5B uh, B29. And you can see that various proteins have plus or minus effects indicated by the arrows or the uh, lines. So you can see that proparadin here, for example, is the only positive regulator of the complement cascade, whereas complement factor H seems to be acting at multiple levels, as also complement factor I, etc. Now, variants in complement regulatory proteins have been shown now to cause atypical HUS uh, and being the most common cause of atypical HUS. Almost 50 to 60% of patients with atypical HUS would be having abnormalities in any of these key uh, genes which encode for these respective complement proteins, or they would be having antibodies to complement factor H, which kind of induces a functional inhibition of complement factor H. Now, if we look at registry data from France, from Italy, from America, and the global registry, we find that complement factor H mutations are the leading cause of atypical HUS, accounting for almost 40% of ad adult or childhood cases. On the other hand, mother membrane cofactor protein is also important, accounting for about 10% cases. C3, CFB, CFI constitute other cases. Thrombomodulin uh, has been speculated as being important, but probably less so in the recent years. It's also complement factor I has probably lost some importance. Antibodies to complement factor H, on the other hand, have emerged as not just important in South Asia, but also in other parts of the world as being an important cause of childhood hemolytic hemic syndrome. You must remember that almost 30-40% cases would not have any abnormality at all. So overall, CFH seems to be most important if you look at the pool prevalence from a uh, meta-analysis. But complement factor H antibodies also account for 7%, as do CFI, C3, etc. Now, more often, 
we see that atypical patients, atypical HUS would be trying, tending to present very often with more than just the three things of, hem uh, he you know, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and AKI. There could be severe neurological manifestations, GI disturbances, hepatic enzyme elevations, pulmonary manifestations, and also cardiac dysfunction in terms of myocardial dysfunction, ocular abnormalities, etc. And at the, uh, you know, at the center of all this is the thrombotic microangiopathy that is shown to be demonstrated in any of these vessel beds. The age and onset of atypical HUS tends to provide to you a clue as to the real underlying problem in many of these cases. And you can make out that, uh, you know, uh, patients with uh, various inherited abnormalities such as CFH and CFI defects, but also DGK defects, tend to present within the first or second years of life. On the other hand, patients with antibodies to complement factor H and also the membrane cofactor protein tend to present actually later in, in much uh, older school age bracket, such as maybe like three to 15 years or so. On the other hand, patients with C3 defects can actually present at any age through their lifespan. Uh, and you know, any and all mutations are known to present at any ages, except for example, maybe the DGK, which is only described in under two population. Patients with no identified abnormality can actually present at any age. If you look at other genotype phenotype associations, we do know that many of these conditions which have complement dysregulation at their center of their pathogenesis would have low C3. And this is particularly true for patients with C3 defects, wherein C3 has a gain of function mutation such that it is constantly getting hydrolyzed and always the C3 is low and complement system is always on. On the other hand, other patients such as complement factor H defects would have less often, but almost always would have low C3. Patients with membrane cofactor protein may not have so much of low C3. Complement factor B gain of function defects, again, would keep the uh, convertase being formed all the time and C3 would be low in these cases. The other things we look at as the clinical parameters. All these severe defects, such as C3 defects, the complement factor uh, uh, B defects, et cetera, would have a high risk of end-stage renal disease, as well as a high risk of a disease to be relapsing and recurring even after transplantation. On the other hand, the membrane cofactor protein defect, while relapses are very, very common, the recurrence after transplant is actually not there because the new kidney brings in membrane of its own and therefore membrane cofactor protein, which is normal, is brought into the body and therefore recurrences don't happen after transplant. The MCP is typical in having high rate of relapses, but a low rate of recurrence and overall better outcome than say C3, which would be really devastating or CFI also would be having a poor impact. The DGK defects tend to occur in young children are not really associated with low C3 because complement pathway should ideally not be involved, but the risk of end-stage renal failure is high and uh, relapses have been described. The DGK is actually a bit unique because DGK variations were only described about 10 years back in the French cohort and the French registry described the phenotype uh, uh, relationships in the sense that the DGK defects were really confined to infancy or very young children. Uh, they, they, these are children who tend to present not just with HUS, but also with a nephrotic state, with low serum albumins, with heavy proteinuria, and the corollary of it on the histopathology would be a feature resembling chronic thrombotic microangiopathy with protocyte effacement, etc. The uh, survival of these kidneys is really low. The children tend to progress to uh, end stage failure by second decade or third decade of life. Vis a vis, you look at other defects like as mem membrane cofactor defect, it actually has the best survival. The C3 and CFB have an intermediate survival, and the CFH defects have a poor survival, similar to a DGK defect. The DGK is actually a, a, a thing that it's an intracellular lipid kinase, and it and it kind of prevents a prothrombotic state from happening in its in its uh, absence of its activity it would be causing a tendency to clot. So these patients are young, they have nephrotic syndrome, and they would not respond to conventional measures that we use for complement factor defects, and they tend to have a high risk of adverse outcomes. The other unique thing that we need to remember is something that is rather common in our parts of the country, of the world, which is antibodies to complement factor H. Now, these autoantibodies, why they form and when they form is not clear, but the children typically present with atypical uh, hemolytic anemic syndrome in the school-going age bracket. And for some reason, we seem to have a seasonal predilection in the winter months, and these antibody treaters are really high. Now, these antibody treaters are not conventionally measured by typical uh, ELISA kits, but by a manual method, which is cumbersome to set up, and is set up in only a few labs in the world. Uh, a positive threshold has to be established for each population. And in the national database that we maintain, uh, we find that antibodies account for almost more than half of the cases of childhood atypical HUS that we see.
These children tend to have severe manifestations with not just the triad, but also extra renal symptoms, neurological in particular, and severe hypertension with very high creatinine, high rates of requirement of dialysis. The age predilection is chiefly between 5 to 15 years age, and this is similar to uh, reports from elsewhere. Uh, clinical features across the world in various cohorts that have been described from, say, Korea, from uh, uh, Europe, etc., appear to sh sh indicate that almost all patients would have tend to have a prodromal illness of abdominal pain, vomiting, etc., followed a week or so by severe AKI and severe anemia. And preceding infections might or might not be present. You may or may not document a, a upper respiratory tract infection. Until date, we do not understand what predisposes or what triggers this illness to develop in these patients. What we do know is that these are antibodies that are IgG3 antibodies principally. And if you look at the entire complement factor H protein, which is comprising of 20 kind of uh, units, these antibodies tend to bind towards one end of the complement factor H protein. And at this end, which is a very important end for maintaining the functions of the complement factor H, uh, by binding them, they induce a sort of a functional deficiency of complement factor H. Now, what we also know, and we don't understand why it is there, is that these complement factor H antibodies, while this is an acquired phenomenon, they almost always develop in the context of an inherited problem that is a copy number variation in related genes, that is the complement factor H related genes 1 and 3. Now, these genes are quite adjacent to the CFH gene, and this is an area of uh, considerable genetic heterogeneity, that is a lot of phenotypic variability is present in normal individuals. Almost 10% of all of us would have complement factor H related 1 gene deletion, but not, I mean, very few of us would have developed HUS. So, so it indicates that this predisposition is there in a lot of people, but the antibodies only develop in a small people, small subset of people. But when the and atypical HUS is present, and if you uh, go back and look at who has CFHR1 deletion or not, almost 80% of these individuals with antibodies would have a CFHR1 deletion. So if you can only pick up the deletion and you have a case of HUS, you can actually sort of uh, say that the odds of having anti-FH HUS is really high, almost 150 fold vis-a-vis -vis of not having antibodies. So we have also documented that this prevalence of uh, CFHR1 uh, deletion is not very different across the globe. While it is probably higher in, say, Africa than in Asia than in Europe, but still the prevalence of this uh, deficiency is not so varied, but the, the, the tendency to have anti-FHHUS is probably more described in South Asia than in other countries. We also know that these antibodies in itself must be pathogenic because there, these are not seemingly associated with other genetic abnormalities, such as, you know, complement factor H mutation or a CF, uh, CFI or a C3 or a CFB change, etc. So we have looked at and demonstrated that antibodies are in themselves probably the cause of the HUS in those patients for the fact that uh, they do not have other abnormalities. Uh, just touching upon certain other types of HUS, complement dysregulation has been described in various forms of secondary HUS, including in the transplant context, in context of malignant hypertension, in presence of drugs, etc. Probably complement dysregulation probably goes out of balance in any of these scenarios, and maybe it, it is meaningful, therefore, to keep this in mind when managing these patients. Uh, another entity that we will not dwell upon, and maybe Dr. Kalaiwani will do a case on this, would be thrombotic throm uh, thrombocytopenic purpura, which is important to differentiate from HUS, particularly in patients who present to you uh, with severe thrombocytopenia and not so severe uh, AKI. Now, it is overall a rare cause of TMA in childhood. Inherited defects would probably be occur clustered towards the young age group and acquired cases towards the older children. But if you look at this kind of a histogram, you'll see that very low density incidence density is present in young children. And it's only beyond 15 years or so that the incidence of TTP begins to climb up. So probably it's not so relevant in childhood. And the age at the first TTP episode, if at all it occurs early, it is probably a congenital type that is a deficiency of ADAMTS-13 rather than antibodies to ADAMTS-13 that will be important in the low lowest age groups, and in the older patient, it will be the acquired forms, that is, anti antibody-associated ADAMTS-13 defects that will be important. Now, assay for this is really very difficult to conduct because it requires a certain kind of equipment and certain kind of assay to be done, and therefore, our guidelines would recommend that you should store samples for these in a particular manner using plasma to be stored and conduct the ADAMTS-13 activity in the standard lab where it is conducted using a FRET-based assay on fresh samples that have been stored for at minus 80 degrees.
another defect to remember is cobalamin deficiency. Now, this again is pathways of the uh, methyl uh, malonyl cobalamin, et cetera, synthesis. And again, this these would account for about 5 to 10 percent cases of atypical HUS. These samples can be stored and processed later. Uh, but uh, it would be something to consider if you can't find a cause, say, in the complement pathway defect. Overall, these th things are important to recognize because therapy is possible with parenteral hydroxycobalamin. So if you can demonstrate that plasma total homocysteine is really elevated and you don't have other abnormalities such as complement factor defects or antibodies to complement factor H, it is worthwhile considering therapy with parenteral hydroxycobalamin, oral betaine, and folate in these individuals. So overall, just for the sake of evaluation of HUS, one would diagnose HUS in the presence of all of these parameters, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, uh, low platelet count, and acute kidney injury as described by KDGO, and you've just had two sessions in the preceding sessions, uh, you must exclude certain mimics of HUS. You know that the triad of anemia, thrombocytopenia, and AKI can be very well met in any sepsis multi-organ dysfunction scenario, and DIC must be ruled out in such circumstances. TTP must be ruled out particularly in presence of severe thrombocytopenia and relatively mild AKI. Infections such as malaria, leptospirosis, and other tropical infections can very well mimic the same triad. So demonstrating microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with schistocytes being present in high numbers, with uh, the hemolysis being demonstrable, would be very important beyond the infection period. So malaria has settled. There is no fever anymore. There's no malarial parasite anymore. And still this problem is persisting. That might indicate to you hemolytic uh, uremic syndrome rather than the active acute phase of malaria having the triad being met. So you must differentiate from TTP and you must consider cobalamin associated HUS. We, simultaneously, you must evaluate for all other causes of severe AKI. So you would want to remember that HUS can be a, a kind of a mimic of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, severe AKI, and associated with it, say anemia and thrombocytopenia of an unrelated cause could also be RPGN, for example. So you must remember that many of these patients would be evaluated similarly to begin with for severe AKI, and then certain clues in the lab parameters might lead you in one direction. Once you have figured out to be HUS, then you would want to investigate for secondary causes, infections, et cetera. You would want to rule out STEC HUS. You would want to remember that complement factors are at the bottom of this. So you'd want to take samples for antifactor H HUS. You would want to send samples for genetics if antifactor H is negative, and you would store samples for homocysteine and ADAMTS-13 activity. Depending on the scenario, you would want to evaluate carefully for pneumococcal or sugar toxin associated HUS. And failing any of these being present, you would want to go for next-gen sequencing. Indications for biopsy would be really limited in patients with HUS. So this is the evaluation algorithm. You would start with demonstrating that this looks like HUS. Then you would want to consider specific etiologies such as infections, uh, cobalamin, secondary causes. And then you'll come to a diagnosis of atypical HUS, within which you would want to evaluate carefully. And uh, the role of ELISAs for various complement factor proteins is limit being limited. You would rely chiefly on antibodies to complement factor H assay and on genetics to evaluate further and arrive at a cause. Now, how would you manage these cases while you await a diagnosis? So up till recently, uh, it was quite standard of care that antibody, when antibodies are not present, and we'll come to antibody management soon, plasma exchanges used to be the standard of care till late 2000s, uh, 2000, up to 2009 or so. This was the standard of care for most centers across the world uniformly. Why? Because plasma exchanges would take care of removing all the dysregulated proteins, uh, providing the new fresh complement factor regulators, remove any inhibitors, such as also antibodies. And... Uh, People have demonstrated that if you were to do intensive plasma exchanges in the with starting very early on and with uh, daily rapid exchanges of one to two, one point five to two volumes, you would have a uh, remission being induced in a uh, 7 to 14 days age bracket. However, all in all, audits have shown in the Europe and other countries in various registry data that the outcomes in general are not very satisfactory. The pediatric onset disease tends to have slightly better renal survival than adult onset disease, but overall the outcomes are not very great. Five-year, 10-year survivals are around 60% or so at best in pediatrics. There was also concerns about safety of plasma exchanges, particularly in young children, shown in audits from the UK, for example. However, we found that probably it's not as unsafe. But certainly, when you look at young children below five years, uh, the risks of catheter-related complications, of uh, insertion, et cetera, were very, very high, uh, associated with procedural complications, et cetera. Now, 
uh, what came in next was eclizumab. And eclizumab has been the game changer for this disease. Eclizumab is a inhibitor of, uh, it, it binds to C5, that is a part, and therefore it prevents the formation of C5A and C5B. And we all know that C5B uh, will go on to form the you know membrane attack complex. So by binding to C5 and preventing its conversion to C5B, it stops and shuts off the complement cascade right there. So the moment you give a dose of eclizumab, C5 is inhibited and no more uh, cascade continuation happens. And therefore, suddenly complement activation stops and suddenly things will begin, begin to reverse. And people have found that there is a very dramatic response in many of their patients. So in renal hematic recovery happened. And you know, obviously, depending on the degree of injury to various organ systems, degree of recovery might, would vary. The only concern is that one dose is not enough. It would, it would require repeated dosing over a period of time. And depending on the etiology, you might need to consider uh, continued therapy over years or months. Uh, people have uh, it has been demonstrated that complement activation could be part of not just complement dysregulation by mutations, but also in secondary forms of HUS. And this drug has been shown to be effective in uh, shutting off complement activation in other scenarios also. And whether the complement defect, if it's an inherited effect, whether it's happening in native kidneys or in post transplant context, it seems to work. The concern here is that it is among the most expensive drugs still available. So even now, when the drug has now recently begun to become available in the country through various sources, the cost of each vial of injection ranges from one to four lakhs a vial. And depending on the size of the child, the child might require as a single dose, one, two, four, or five vials. And you can imagine that obviously repeated dosing after a week or, other, or two weeks, et cetera, would not be feasible for the majority of our patients. The duration of therapy is not yet determined, uh, but efficacy has been clearly demonstrated uh, in small studies, but definitely people have demonstrated that the, uh, uh, the renal function kind of tends to recover. And uh, this has been demonstrated to be typically so for patients with atypical HUS. However, there is a certain risk of infections. Eclusimab, uh, since it complement forms a barrier against infections as well, uh, particularly the risk of meningococcal infections and invasive infections seems to increase following eclusimab therapy. And the risk is, is not just for meningococcal, it's also for other infections such as viral infections, that probably there's a slightly higher risk. Uh, the other drug that has come up has been ravalumumab. And ravalumumab is nothing but a long-acting congener of eculizumab. And if you look at the dosing protocols, if eculizumab requires dosing, say, every two weeks, then ravalumumab requires to be given every two months or monthly. The adverse effect profile seems to be similar. Uh, I mean, at least eculizumab very recently has become available in our country. Ravalumumab is still not marketed, uh, but now it is beginning to occupy the majority of the US and Europe markets because of the you know, uh, feasibility of administering it less frequently than eculizumab requires to be administered. Interventions, uh, when they were these two interventions have been compared in a small systematic review, they seem to have similar, uh, you know, efficacy and reduce the dialysis need considerably. And there's good hematremission with both agents. So what would guidelines now say? You would say that any patient with atypical HUS initiate therapy with eclizumab rapidly within 24 to 48 hours of diagnosis. And if it's not available or cannot be arranged at all, only then would you consider therapy, plasma therapy, preferably in the form of plasma exchanges and less preferably in the form of plasma infusions. Once eclizumab is available, start therapy with eclizumab. The only exception that's been made is for antibodies to factor H and we'll come to that. Overall, all guidelines across the world now suggest preferring eclizumab for any patient with atypical HUS, uh, exceptions being antibodies to factor H. Where developing countries come in, that is the scenario why we needed to develop the guidance where developing countries do not have access to eclizumab. Previously, the drug was not even available in the market. Now, at least it's begun to become marketed. But uh, in that context, we needed a guideline for ourselves. So what we have in our guideline for ourselves is that since we didn't have access to eclizumab, uh, where the patient does not have antibodies to complement factor H, therein as well, we would do plasma exchanges because plasma exchanges would at least uh, some to some extent correct the complement dysregulation. Daily exchanges should be conducted till hematremission and then taper over three to four weeks and monitor for reactions, be careful around monitoring and try to make therapy with eclizumab available, particularly in refractory patients or with life-threatening features or those who develop complications. Other therapies that are being evaluated 
are uh, other C5 inhibitors such as crovalumumab. Now, crovalumumab actually is a longer acting preparation because it gets recycled into the circulation and is also effective in certain patients who have polymorphisms to C5 that do not allow binding to eclosibab. There's another congener called Zilucoplan, which has been tested in myasthenia gravis, but it is an ultra short acting drug, but it has been shown to be useful. It inhibits cleavage of C5, also occupies space on C6, such that it also shuts the formation of membrane attack complex. Elizaria is a congener, is a biosimilar to Eclosimab, which has been developed by a Russian company. It has yet to undergo formal testing. Uh, agents such as iptacopan would bind to factor B, shut it off, and therefore it would cause, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of regulation of the complement cascade. Avacopan is something that acts on C5A, not on the real alternate cascade, but on C5A, which is an anaphylotoxin. And therefore, it's useful more in inflammatory disorders such as anchor associated vasculitis. Uh, other agents such as uh, lectin pathway, uh, uh, you know, inhibitors, et cetera, are being examined in different contexts. What about antibodies to complement factor H? This is a context in which we are fortunate that we have antibodies to complement factor H more often than other defects. And therein, it is a useful way to manage them would be to start plasma exchanges and administer immunosuppression. Plasma exchanges actually take care of removing the antibodies, the IgG antibodies, very rapidly. In five to seven exchanges, there's almost a 90% reduction in levels. And we have demonstrated that in various of our studies from previously. And we also try to look at whether adding MM, uh, IVIG to it helps or not. It really does not. Uh, we do know, however, that many patients would continue to have high antibodies uh, during follow-up uh, despite being in revision. Now, these high are more than detectable high, but they are not as high as during relapse or active phase. Uh, within this, patients with sort, sort of more than 1,300 uh, arbitrary units per ml uh, levels or higher would tend to have a tendency to relapse. Now, these relapses tend to occur most often in the first two years of life, and we need to kind of keep a close watch on these antibodies, therefore, in the first two years of life. Also, we try to reduce these levels by maintaining them on immunosuppression. Uh, it is a surrogate marker of uh, activity would be these antibody treaters, but also the presence of free factor H. And we look at the levels of free factor H in the blood uh, in a research study, and we showed that low free factor H levels tended to predict a relapse as well. Relapses usually occur within the first two years, and the tendency to relapse is present in almost 20% of cases. Very few would relapse beyond two years, and we saw a surge in relapses in the SARS-CoV infection context, as also has been demonstrated in context of other infections remotely. So to prevent relapses, one would induce, uh, you know, de decrease in production of antibodies by giving induction immunosuppression with prednisolone and IV cyclophosphamide, and then maintaining them on immunosuppression with an agent such as mycophenolate, mofetil, or as a thiopryn. We have demonstrated that the combination of these two, immunosuppression and plasma exchanges, has the best outcomes and best renal survival and best relapse-free survival as compared to using either therapies or no therapy. Overall, with use of a unified protocol, the outcomes seem to have improved in the last 10 years. Overall, initiating plasma exchanges rapidly and using combination with immunosuppression tends to improve outcomes manifold. A very high teeter at the onset seems to have an impact on outcome adversely. What is the role of uh, eclusimab? Eclusimab has been anecdotally used in European context in patients with antibody associated HUS and does not seem to have too much of an impact, but still requires some examination. Uh, anecdotal reports suggest that eclusimab does shut down uh, complement uh, pathway, but obviously it would require to be looked at as to whether the levels really stay low. Uh, this is a unified uh, algorithm indicating how you would manage our patient. This is present in our guidelines. So you would start daily plasma exchanges, give 1.5 to 2 volume exchanges, consider eclusimab if patient is refractory to therapy. You start immunosuppression prednisolone. Once you're on alternate day prednisolone you, and you have induced hematological remission, then you switch to alternate day prednisolone, alternate day plasma exchanges. You then could move to IV cyclophosphamide for three to five doses and taper off plasma exchanges in the next uh, 10 to 12 sessions. We've also demonstrated that instead of doing 18 to 22 sessions, we can manage to make do with 10 to 12 sessions and as long as you're also instituting uh, immunosuppression and as long as the teeters have fallen to below, say, 1300 uh, AU per ml. Uh, we carry on immunosuppression with prednisolone for about a year and with MMF for about two years to cover the period of high risk of relapses and then taper both off. Patients who have not, uh, you know, 
recovered their kidney function, we would withdraw immunosuppression. So overall, for these patients, we would recommend the combination of plasma exchange and immunosuppressive therapy. And we do not recommend uh, immunosuppressive agents alone without documenting the presence of antibodies. This is very, very important to remember because almost half the cases would not have antibodies. And it is important not to give immunosuppression to a patient who is otherwise very sick. Uh, so th these guidelines are just as I have already enunciated for you. So these, again, are just a reiteration. So uh, once a patient relapses, we would manage them as a primary disease, again, start with plasma exchanges and consider immunosuppression increment. So I'll just end here with a summary slide, again, taken from the recent Lancet review, uh, indicating how you would evaluate for and manage patients with hemolytic uric syndrome. Uh, you suspect the diagnosis, you confirm the diagnosis, you consider various entities, and you manage them accordingly. So patients with STEC HUS would require chiefly supportive care after having demonstrated the infection in the form of a stool culture, as well as demonstrating the toxin. The strep pneumonia HUS, I did not in the interest of time uh, manage to dwell on this. Uh, we would want to manage them by managing the primary infection very, very well in good supportive care. This is again centered around supportive care and nothing additional. Uh, do not do plasma exchanges there. Infection associated HUS would in, you look for complement uh, pathway activation. Otherwise, you would really uh, uh, you would really consider most of the other cases as atypical HUS, especially in childhood. Uh, you would store samples for ADAMTS-13 activity and cobalamin defects. And if the teeters of antibodies are negative, the genetics is negative, you'd probably want to go on and test for those and manage them accordingly. Patient who right away look to you like TTP uh, because of a very severe thrombocytopenia and with no AKI would merit plasma exchanges because that is the standard of care for TTP there. Uh, immunosuppression in the antibody context. Uh, metabolism associated, we've just discussed. Atypical HUS, you would want to evaluate for antibodies to complement factor H. You would want to send out genetics if these are negative. And uh, you would consider also DGK HUS in certain contexts with early onset. And therapy for majority of atypical HUS, which is antibody negative, should ideally be eclusimab. If it's not available, as in as to many of us, you would institute plasma exchanges. For patients with antibody H associated HUS, you would rely on plasma exchanges and immunosuppression. If the disease is at quite refractory, then you would consider eclusima. So I'll close here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aditi. That was a really nice, um, very constant review of the whole topic, presenting all the evidence and the guidelines. Um, I think we will go on to the next talk and then uh, address questions and uh, further issues at the end. So the next talk is uh, given by Dr. Kalaiwani Ganesan. Uh, she is from Metha Children's Hospital in Chennai, and she will tell us how we are to use these uh, all the evidence and all the guidelines that we have heard about when we actually face uh, clinical symptoms. So I think it's uh, Dr. Aditi we could um, stop sharing and Salaiwan uh, could start. So Dr. Kalaiwani is the Deputy Head and Senior Consultant of the Department of Pediatric Histology, Meta Children's Hospital. So the floor. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, ma'am. Is my slides visible? Yes, they are. We have continued to go into uh, slideshow. Slideshow. You are not sharing anymore. Yeah, fine. Good evening. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Baga, sir. And uh, thanks to all the panelists present here. So we'll be discussing a few interesting cases on hemolytic uremic syndrome. So this is case one. It's a seven years old male child who's born out of non consanguineous marriage and they are from Chennai. And uh, the child also presented with a gross hematuria and fever for four days. The child had decreased uh, urine output for two days and significant edema. There was no other negative histories and there is no family history of renal disease in the family. So on examination, the child was uh, lethargic, 
when the temperature was normal, the child was noticed to have pallor. There was significant pedal edema and uh, blood pressure was more than 95th centile. Other systemic examination was found to be normal. So this is a list of investigations uh, done for this child and this is a trend of the investigations. And uh, the initial on day one, the uh, hemoglobin was 3.4 uh, and uh, the platelet count was 49,000. And uh, on day one, and the urea was uh, more than 200 with a creatinine of 4.6. LDH was elevated, which was more than 2000. And uh, high uric acid was documented, which was 10.8. And the subsequent values after initiating ferrosis on day one, child was also started on hemodialysis in view of high urea and creatinine. And uh, dialysis was done with priming with PRBC. And uh, these are the important lab values we have documented. We have not put all the lab values together. And uh, on day eight, uh, day eight, the child had a hemoglobin of uh, 9.3. And uh, 12, it was 7.7 .7 with increasing trend of platelet count. And uh, towards day 14, the platelet count uh, rose to 2.3 lakhs. And there was a dropping trend of urea and creatinine noted. And urine protein also had significant proteinuria with plenty of uh, RBCs in the urine. And peripheral smear was suggestive of uh, hemolysis. C3 was low in this child and the DCT was negative and anti-factor H antibodies were sent and the reports were awaited. So in summary, with the labs and the history of the child, it's a seven-year-old child who had a rapidly progressive renal failure, which is evidenced by decreased urine output, high urea and creatinine. And the peripheral smear was suggestive of hemolysis with severe uh, thrombocytopenia and with elevated LDH. Urine analysis uh, showed significant proteinuria and uh, factor H antibody titer was pending and genetic analysis was sent for this child. So this child required plasma pheresis, which was initiated on day one, and the child required almost 22 sessions of plasma pheresis. And hemodialysis was also done for this child because urea and creatinine was initially more than 200, which subsequently uh, dropped with hemodialysis. And the child's antibody uh, titers were turned out to be positive, which was more than 10,000. So child was started on immunosuppression with the oral steroids of two milligram per kg, for, which was given for four weeks and then subsequently tapered off to one milligram per kg. And child was initiated on monthly pulse dose of cyclophosphamide. So monthly pulse of uh, cyclophosphamide was given for six doses. And uh, because child had a uh, very high blood pressure, child was continued with antihypertensive medications and child required multiple antihypertensives for BP control. So this is a genetic analysis of this child. And uh, this showed uh, complement factor H receptor 3 and complement factor H uh, receptor 1 deletion. And as Dr. Aditi had already mentioned in the theory part, you can have either complement factor, um, anti-factor H antibodies, which can be positive, or it can also be negative when it is associated with a complement factor HR3 or 1 deletion. So moving on to case 2. It's a five-year uh, five and eight-months-old male child born out of third-degree consanguineous marriage. The child had decreased urine output and facial puffiness for or lost it for three days. And child also had hematuria and vomiting. And there was history of loose tools uh, uh, 10 to 12 days back before the illness. So on, uh, there was no other negative histories and there was no uh, history of intake of native medicines and there is no uh, similar illness in the past or not there is a family history of similar illness. So on examination, the child was looking dull and the child was looking pale and the child was looking uh, ectric as well. Blood pressure was more than 95th centile, requiring antihypertensives for blood pressure control. And the child also had uh, pedal edema. Other systemic examination was normal. So the investigation done on uh, May uh, 2022, the initial hemoglobin was very low, which is around 3.4 with a platelet count of 71,000. So with this hemoglobin, we had to uh, initiate the child on PRBC transfusion. And the very next day, having a suspicion of hemolytic uh, uremic syndrome, we had started the ch child on uh, plasma pheresis. And the urea and creatinine was very high. Urea was more than 325 with a creat of 2.94. So child 
who was subsequently started on uh, plasma pheresis and uh, hemodialysis. And this is the trend of uh, hemoglobin and platelet count. So af even after initiating plasma pheresis, there was a dropping trend of uh, platelets, which um, dropped from 78 to 33,000. And slowly it started improving to 55 and to 57,000. And we continued plasma pheresis as per protocol. Initially, the child uh, received almost from 23rd to 27th continuous five cycles of plasma pheresis. Then we switched over to alternate day uh, pheresis. And the LDH count was also very high. Peripheral smear again was suggestive of um, hemolysis. Uh, C3 was low. But this child had a factor H antibody, which was negative. But in view of hemolytic picture, the plasma pheresis was continued and the child received almost 11 sessions of plasma pheresis, which was started on day two of hospital stay. And hemodialysis also 11 sessions was required because there was a significant drop in hemoglobin. The child required PRBC transfusion for more than six times. And the oral the child was started on oral steroids initially, uh, having sent the complement factor uh, um, reports and the reports were awaited. The child was started on immunosuppression and the child also received uh, one dose of cyclophosphamide. But having um, titers which was negative, we subsequently uh, slowly tapered and stopped the oral steroids and the second dose of cyclophosphamide was not given. And the child, in view of uh, hand, um, hypertension, the child was on multiple antihypertensive drugs. So this was the genetic report which showed a complement factor I deficiency with a negative antibody titers. Moving on to case three, it's a three month old male child, first born to non-consanguinous marriage. And we happened to see the mother antenatally because uh, during the fifth uh, month antenatal uh, scan, the child, uh, the baby was uh, noticed to have right MCDK and uh, the child was referred to us for antenatal uh, counseling and uh, we had counseled the mother for postnatal follow up. And uh, during her antenatal period, the, she did not have any fever with rashes and her antenatal period was uneventful. And she uh, delivered a, a baby which was weighing 2.6 kgs and baby did not require any NICU admissions and the baby was on exclusive breastfeeding. At uh, third month of life, the child was brought uh, with uh, recurrent episodes of vomiting and uh, the mother noticed that the baby was lethargic for uh, last four to five days. And the mother also noticed that the baby has been passing less amount of urine for two days. There is no similar illness in the family or no renal illness in the family. So the child was uh, investigated on OPD basis outside because um, there was antenatally detected right MCDK, there was a follow-up ultrasound which was done. And uh, along uh, because child was lethargic and had vomiting, the, they also happened to do a hemogram, which uh, had a documentation of anemia and thrombocytopenia. In view of anemia and thrombocytopenia with the underlying uh, renal issue, the child was referred here for further management. So on examination, the child was uh, very much lethargic. The child was looking very pale and the weight and uh, height uh, length percentile was less than third centile. Child had tachycardia, respiratory rate of 46 and blood pressure was normal. And uh, the abdominal examination revealed a mass which was palpable, which because it is a right MCDK and other systemic examination was normal. So this was the initial investigation. The hemoglobin initial documentation was 5.7 with a platelet count of 89,000. And um, we had to transfuse the child. And then the subsequent record documentation was hemoglobin was 8.4 and the platelet count was uh, 52,000. And um, the um, blood urea, nitrogen and serum creatinine was normal. LDH, LDH was slightly elevated, which was more than 700 and uric acid was uh, normal, but the peripheral smear was suggestive of severe hemolysis. C3 and C4 was normal. Bilirubin was also uh, like just elevated, but DCT was negative because it's a three months old child. We also did a TOT screening, which turned out to be negative. And uh, because like 
the platelet and hemoglobin was low, but with normal uh, renal function test and there is ongoing hemolysis and peripheral smear also was suggestive of hemolysis. We had a thought of uh, probably like uh, other metabolic causes of HUS. So uh, we did a homocysteine levels, which was very high which was more than 50 and urine MMA was uh, um, high. It was more than 298, but uh, uh, B12 levels was normal. Ultrasound as a routine as a postnatal scan, it showed right MCDK, which was a bigger size kidney. Other than that, uh, there was no other significant finding. So on uh, day uh, 29, the child was um, though uh, having a suspicion of vitamin uh, cobalamin deficiency. We started the child on vitamin B12. As per protocol, it needs to be uh, 1,000 uh, um, mcg. But being a smaller child, uh, three months, we initiated the child on um, vitamin B12 injections, 500 mcg. IV was given for uh, five continuous days. And then we followed up subsequently with the labs and hemoglobin was um, subsequent hemoglobin recording was 7.9 and the platelet uh, count was just elevated, which was 88,000. So having a suspicion of uh, cobalamin deficiency, we had sent a genetic panel and the child was started as uh, discussed, was started on hydroxycobalamin 500, M, uh, 500 mcg IV daily for five days. And this is how the child needs to be followed up if we have a suspicion of cobalamin deficiency. And the plasma pheresis has got no role in cobalamin deficiency. So we did not think of plasma pheresis, though the child had a low hemoglobin, ongoing hemolysis and a severe thrombocytosis. So uh, we had already given one weekly dose of uh, hydroxycobalamin and child was also initiated on folic acid supplementation. Uh, it's a suspected cobalamin deficiency with the uh, genetic panel which is awaited. Next is uh, moving on to case four. It is a 10 years old healthy female child who was brought to us with increasing lethargy. Child also had headache and had one episode of uh, fainting attack. There was no history of uh, renal uh, history in form of oliguria, vomiting, headache. There was no breathlessness or seizures documented and there is no significant past or family history. The child was noticed to have uh, severe pallor. There was no actress or uh, edema or lymphadenopathy. Heart rate was normal. Respiratory rate was 28. Blood pressure was also normal. And other systemic examination was normal. And there was no focal neurological deficit. So with the positive uh, finding of pallor in this child, hemoglobin was documented to have uh, to be four and platelet was very, very less uh, severe thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of uh, 5,000 and the peripheral smear was suggestive of microspherocytes, cystocytes and target cells and active hemolysis was documented and the retic count was very, very high, which was more than 14.3%. So with these investigations and background, with this background history, we had in mind autoimmune hemolytic anemia, Evan syndrome, and Milo uh, dysplasia. So uh, as per hematologist opinion, we also did a bone marrow and uh, the, it was a cellular marrow with adequate megakaryocytes and marked erythroid hyperplasia with the blast cells of less than 5%. And usually in uh, uh, myeloid dysplasia, uh, blast cells usually will has to be less than 20%, which uh, differentiates from AML as well. And to rule out uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, we also did a direct scomes test, which was negative. Uh, cold agglutinin was also negative, but there was ongoing hemolysis, which was evidenced by high titers of LDH. So we had a diagnosis of uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, HUS, TTP. So this is a summary of the whole investigations. This child had a creatinine, which was normal. The creat was only 0.5 and the electrolytes were, was also normal. Hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobin was uh, four and platelet count was very, very less. It was less than uh, 5,000, which is documented in multiple settings. And the reti count was very high, which is suggestive of ongoing hemolysis. And the LDH also was very high. Uh, other parameters, bilirubin, uh, serum albumin, everything was negative. Serology was negative. And complement C3, C4 was normal. ANA was normal. Anti-DNA was also negative. 
And in urine analysis, we had a positive uh, history of uh, child having a proteinuria, significant proteinuria, but there was no uh, microscopic hematuria documented as well. So with this summary uh, of investigations, we had a uh, TTP diagnosed on the basis of having microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, severe thrombocytopenia, which was documented to be less than 5,000 in multiple settings, and uh, neurological feature in form of headache this child had, and renal manifestation in form of proteinuria. So with the diagnosis of uh, TTP, we had uh, started the child on plasma pheresis with 1.5 times uh, uh, plasma volume exchange with a weighted ADAM13 deficiency because this child did not have AKI, but the child had severe thrombocytopenia and renal manifestations in form of proteinuria. So ruling out many other causes, the other thing uh, we had to consider was ADAM13 deficiency and uh, we had already take, preserved the sample for um, ADAM13 and which was sub, uh, subsequently processed. So ADAM13 activity was found to be less than 3%, which is falling under the category of severe deficiency. And ADAM13 inhibitor was uh, 3.8, which is suggestive of autoantibodies, antibodies against uh, ADAM13 activity. So uh, just uh, already theory part has been discussed by uh, Dr. Aditi, just a short outline. Uh, TTP is due to deficiency of one Willebrand factor, cleaving protein that is ADAM13. Uh, ADAM13 acts like a scissor to actually break the one Willebrand factor. And in congenital TTP, there will be inherited deficiency of ADAM13. Whereas in acquired uh, immune uh, TTP, you will have reduction of ADAM13 by autoantibodies. So in normal subjects, uh, ADAM13 acts like a scissors to break the von Willebrand factor. When ADAM13 is deficient, you will have a lot of um, von Willebrand factor gets accumulated and you will have accumulation of, uh, you will have platelet aggregation as well, which causes uh, thrombosis. So what are all the clinical manifestation a child can have when you are suspecting TTP? So this child can present with severe thrombocytopenia. So they can have either epistaxis, bruising, petechiae. This child initially when they presented, the child did not have any of these. But subsequently during the course of hospital stay, child developed uh, petechiae. There was no hemorrh hemorrhagia or hemoptysis documented in this child. And uh, neurological manifestation can uh, in this child uh, in our index child was just headache, which was not all that uh, significant. The child did not have severe headache, uh, like uh, affecting the regular activities, but the child just kept complaining of headache. And uh, we should remember that neurological manifestations uh, can uh, range from uh, confusions to headache, altered sensorium, cognition, defect, which, uh, and uh, you can also have visual problems. And what our index child had was headache. And you can have other non-specific symptoms in form of fever, you can have pallor, fatigue, arthralgia, and uh, renal impairment. Uh, you know, usually AKI is not routinely uh, documented in children with ADAM13 deficiency. Uh, the percentage would be only 10 to 12% uh, of AKI can be documented in ADAM13. And the renal manifestation, what our index child had is proteinuria. There was not even microscopic hematuria. So uh, congenital TTP was uh, like the diagnosis of congenital TTP is usually confirmed by ADAM13 activity, which is less than uh, 5% and our index child had only 3% in absence of antibody. The, that is what we need to remember. You will have ADAM13 deficiency, which is less than 5% in absence of antibody, then it is for congenital TTP. And uh, congenital TTP should always be considered in any children and adult with severe and explain thrombocytopenia. So you can have other subgroups of TTP that is acute um, TTP, which is characterized by your uh, antibodies, usually IgG directed against ADAM13. You can have drug-induced TTP, you can have uh, HIV-induced pregnancy-associated post-transplant and malignancy-associated microangiopathy. So uh, we, you can have a differential diagnosis of autoimmune hemolysis, Ivan syndrome. You can have HELP syndrome, vasculitis, and all these things had been excluded in our index child. And uh, finally, we had done ADAM13 deficient, uh, ADAM13 levels, which was found to be normal, which was found to be low. Sorry.
So the treatment of acute TTP is usually plasmapheresis, which we start with 1.5 times uh, exchange. And uh, the volume of exchange can be uh, reduced to one time exchange when the clinical condition and laboratory is test stabilizes. And daily pheresis is required minimum for uh, two days once your lab parameters uh, stabilizes. That is, your platelet count has to be more than 1.5 lakhs and your LDH has to be less than uh, 450. And uh, you can also do a single donor plasma infusion or intermediate purity factor of uh, factor 8 can be used. For for treatment of congenital TTP. And all that we need to re remember is response to pheresis is always variable. So we can't always look for the normal response in case of ADAM13 deficiency. So further treatment is methylprednisolone, which is 10 to 20 uh, milligram per kg, and then uh, which has to be given for three consecutive day, uh, days, followed by oral prednisolone. And in acute uh, idiopathic TTP, you can have neurological, when you have neurological and cardiac uh, issues, as uh, our index child had a headache, which was considered as a neurological issue, you need to uh, um, simultaneously do plasma pheresis and start the child on immunosuppression in form of uh, steroids or uh, rituximab. So patients with refractory or relapsing immune-mediated TTP should be offered rituximab. Uh, rituximab. So going back to our case, uh, the child was continued with daily plasma pheresis with 1.5 times exchange, but we did not find an expected improvement. Hence, we decided to add the child on rituximab and the child received almost three doses of rituximab at uh, weekly once uh, the child received and there was a uh, noted uh, good response and uh, subsequently we tapered the plasma pheresis. And uh, we should remember that acquired uh, TTP is rare in pediatric age group and a child uh, not responded to conventional pheresis and finally responded to rituximab. What is the cause for uh, non-response is basically the late diagnosis and late initiation of treatment may be the cause of non-response to conventional treatment. So once you suspect uh, TTP, you need to you know, start pheresis and uh, when you have an unusual presentation, it is always better to initiate the child on rituximab along with other immunosuppressive therapy in parallel with your pheresis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kalavani, for a very interesting uh, spectrum of cases of interest, including one of TTP also. Um, I think Dr. Aditi has been answering all the questions uh, in the uh, question answer box. Uh, can I ask some, uh, a couple of questions that may be of clinical importance to all of our clinicians? Um, many of the cases of atypical HAS need a infective trigger to start the cascade of microangiopathy. Um, and sometimes that infective trigger might be diarrhea. Like, so like your first case, there was a history of diarrhea. So when in a patient who has a history, past history of diarrhea, uh, do we suspect that there might be something else going on and shift from this supportive therapy to something uh, more aggressive like plasma exchange, suspecting that there might be an underlying complement uh, abnormality. Probably like the usual presentation of typical multiple episodes of diarrhea and then a child landing up with AKI or low platelets was not found in this child. I mean, the child had just one, one day of diarrhea, which was documented 10, 15 days before this, uh, the child reached the hospital. It is always, as you mentioned, it is a second hit. There might be an underlying genetic abnormality, which is not evident always, but when you have a second hit in form of any infection, which is triggering it and then the child can have the manifestations. And uh, these children, when we start these children on so normal, the supportive treatment, uh, thinking and consideration of uh, typical HUS, uh, just fluids, isotonic fluids and uh, supportive care, they might not respond if it is going to be, a, if they have an underlying genetic abnormality because it was only an infection which has triggered an underlying factor. It is not that just an infection which has caused the whole HUS. Someone who has a very severe Um, ma'am, your voice is not audible. 
So I think you answered that very good. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Yeah, so if there is persistence of uh, the HUS uh, manifestations, or if it is a very severe episode, then we might consider that there might be an underlying uh, abnormality which which can be looked for. Um, Thank you. And um, Aditi, you answered a lot of questions, but I think one common question that people seem to have asked repeatedly is the role of rituximab. Would you like to talk about that? Um, just for everybody. Yeah, ma'am. I was just hoping that Sir is also here. I don't think I see him in the list. No. So overall, yeah, overall, we are, uh, I've written my views there in the uh, answer. I mean, there seems to be no real difference. I mean, we know uh, uh, cyclophosphamide uh, would also act on similar principles as rituximab. Rituximab would cause selective B cell depletion, agree. Uh, overall, we felt by looking at a small set of patients in whom we administered rituximab vis-a-vis -vis when we administered cyclophosphamide that there was no major difference in outcomes. In fact, the teeters, if anything, was slightly higher on the rituximab side in the retrospective comparison, although the risk of relapses was similar. Now, these were small comparisons, so we don't know what's the truth. Maybe long-term data is required, but we all know that probably cyclophosphamide is time-tested if we give four to five doses, uh, we should have decent uh, inhibition of antibodies. We have more experience with and comfort with use of cyclophosphamide than with use of rituximab as a entire time span of how many decades of use each agent has. And given its cost, obviously, we would probably, our principle would still be to continue using cyclophosphamide. Somehow we feel probably it's got more robust immunosuppression with four to five doses being given than with two doses of rituximab. But this is nothing very uh, proven. I mean, there's no evidence or anything about. Ma'am, we can't hear you. Ma'am? Comparison, so we are uh, so the maximum experience in this. I think that is what you are summarizing. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Aditi, uh, any association of COVID 19 with HUS? So we did find a spate of cases and we actually published it uh, last year. Uh, in 2021, uh, the wave that was the disastrous one, mm -hmm. we had uh, patients presenting with relapses even eight years down, nine years down, we had two patients. And so normally we see a spate of cases in the winter months, like entire country would probably have a surge during Jan to March and then a quiet period between April to September. October. And in that year, we had a spate of cases June, July, August. So that was about two months down the peak of the COVID wave, the Delta. And uh, that's why we felt that probably SARS-CoV-2 had something to trigger the antibodies. But mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have a way to prove it. We did publish this in pediatric nephrology. Sir. But they, did they respond to remdesivir or tocilizumab or the standard treatment of HUS? So standard treatment, it wasn't as if it was active SARS-CoV-2 that was causing a problem. It was mm -hmm. the fact that epidemiologically, the country was going through a wave and these patients presented more often during that time. Not that they were, two of them were PCR positive, but majority of, I mean, a few of them were PCR positive, but then, I mean, it wasn't as if they were actively infected and sick or anything. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think uh, I wish there's the time to close. Uh... Uh, webinar and I think over to Jitender, Dr. Jitender. Could you Thank you, sir. That last question about confirming sick uh, infection because it is something we struggle with. Most of us, I think, it is uh, difficult to for us uh, to. For all of us, ma'am, yeah. Um, Most often the patient is coming to us too late in the day and we there is no way for us to confirm. Very rarely would a stool PCR be positive at that stage. And that is always a problem. But, you know, at the same time, uh, I mean, maybe it's all an issue of how late the patients are referred to us and how patients report to us. Because in the Western scenario, the same patients do get picked up by PCR and by toxin assays. So maybe the time to presentation does matter as also the assays we do. Uh, it is never possible to prove. So most of our cases would therefore be probable cases. So if you definitely have a bloody diarrhea in the background and you have HUS developing and you have other subtle clues to shigellosis, such as you have a child in the right age bracket, you have probably other cases going on around and uh, you have uh, maybe neutrophilic leukocytosis and other supportive features that probably indicate to you shigellosis. Then you might be more certain. 
but yeah it's always very difficult we we hardly ever diagnose uh, stack hus we always think that it's because where we are sitting is probably where we get only referred cases but uh, it's true that many maybe the cases are also very few or the idea is yeah yeah Okay, over to you, Dipendra. Uh, thank you, everyone, for such a nice and interesting.